Michael Imperioli is ready. He Bringing is, him uh, in right now. <clears throat> he is on. Well, he's got a podcast called uh, Talking Sopranos. It's available I'm on episode now three. on uh, <laughs> Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. Steve Sharippa is uh, his co-host on that uh, too. Michael, you on or is he on? He's here. Is he? I, we, I see him. I don't I hear see him. him. You don't oh, hear me? I don't see him. There he no. is. <clears throat> we hear you now. You hear me? Okay. So good. there he is. Hey, what's going on, man? How are you, buddy? I'm doing well. Where are you at? I'm in Santa Barbara. Oh, that's a good place to be. Well, not bad. Not a bad place. Yeah. I was in New York from September till March 1st. And then I got here. And then I was supposed to go back to New York end of March. And I've just been here ever since. Um, we'll talk about the podcast. And I guess we'll uh, talk some Sopranos as well. I what happened to the Sopranos feature? What what's the status of that? Kings it was supposed, to, yeah, it was supposed to be released in September, and now it's been moved to March. But it's it's finished. It's in the can. So, I wow. guess they every. I think a lot of the theatrical releases are all getting pushed back because, right. So it, it's 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 due to come out in a little less than a year. Yeah. Oh, okay, and. Um, can we talk a little about what what's in that movie? I mean, I know you can't give away stuff, but how much? Of I mean, it, I how much can we talk about? I don't know much about it because I'm not I'm not involved in it. It's I mean, you're not involved at all in it. It's a prequel. No, it's a prequel. It's, oh, it's a focused. young a young Tony Soprano played by his son. Yeah, and I think the main character is Dicky Moltisanti, who is my father, my character's father. So really? there may be. My character is a baby in the movie. I don't know, but um, yeah. But the main character, I think, is uh, played by Alessandro Nivola, and he plays Dicky Moltisanti. Wow. I yeah. did not. I, I now, now I remember it's a prequel and blah, 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 but I still didn't know who all was in and, and who all was uh, out. So, uh, Sopranos, where can we see the Sopranos now? Where is it streaming? It's streaming for on. free on HBO Go. Uh, just at, actually, they've been streaming a lot of their classic shows for quarantine for people. It's crazy. I guess it's a public service for people. I guess. <laughs> it's crazy. The Sopranos is a classic show. I mean, it's classic by virtue of it's great, but it's not that old. You know, it's yeah. like their classics is like you know something from the way back in the day. But Sopranos fits the, fits the bill. Yeah, and oddly, in the last and one of the reasons why we're doing a podcast in the last year and a half, I noticed a whole other generation becoming obsessed with the show, like late teens, 20s, early 30s, who were too young when it was first on, who have discovered it on streaming and are binging it. Like, you know, when it first came out, you couldn't binge watch it. You had to wait till Sunday and watch it, you know, with Sunday night at nine. And uh, But a whole, gen I get a lot of social media, you know, communication from very young people, which is really interesting from all around the world too. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because we all had that relationship with sitcoms and, you know, I Love Lucy and the Three Stooges and stuff that they just repurposed. All the cartoons, I mean, half those Saturday morning cartoons were stuff from the 40s and the 50s and 60s, and they just kept re-airing re it, and it was brand new to us. I have kids, my 13-year-old twins, they've been all the way – through uh friends my son's all the way through they're all the way through the simpsons you know i mean it's still ongoing the family guy i had them both sit down and watch the wire when they were five <laughs> tired <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> and i imagine that they will then get on to the sopranos uh pretty pretty soon that'll be probably one of their their next ones um Michael, I'm just looking down here. I'm just jumping around. Avid practitioners of Taekwondo, you and your you and your family. Is that true? Yeah, we all started together around well, the four of us started around 2002 and then my youngest started a few years after that. Um and now uh the two youngest don't practice anymore, but my wife and I still do and my oldest went back to it as, an, as she's almost 30 now. Yeah. Um, tell, talk, talk about what that does for you and how that works for you. 
Well, at the time, it was during The Sopranos, and I was smoking a pack or more cigarettes a day, uh, drinking a lot, and um, not exercising. I didn't exercise for years, literally. And my kids started doing it, and I met the instructor, Grandmaster Kang, who has a great studio in Tribeca, New York, TKT. And I met him, and I, and I really liked him and just the kind of person he was. So I tried it and it stuck really, you know, and uh, um, it just, I did it more as a physical just you know, to get back into exercise, but it led to me getting into eating healthier and it led to meditation in a way, just because I liked when, when you do martial arts, you can't really think of anything else. Like if you're, if you, I also sometimes I'll do a treadmill or elliptical or something, but my mind's all over the place. And yes, but uh, Taekwondo, you really, it takes all your attention and focus. And I like that aspect of it and kind of led to other things, you know, like meditation and, and, and even Buddhism beyond that, although they're not really necessarily connected. Yeah. We were talking about that over the last few shows about you can, you know, jog on a treadmill or take a walk or something. But if you're still just kind of listening to the news feed mm-hmm. or watching the news feed, it's not really going to serve its purpose. I mean, you'll burn some calories, but your brain will still kind of be fried from looking at uh, graphics of uh, body counts from uh, COVID-19, you know. But if you can get engaged in something where you can't really look away, I mean, any the thing that's kind of liberating about any sort of sport where there's an opponent or like I've always said, when you're driving a race car, there is no mind wandering anything. If there's someone across from you on a mat, you just, you don't drift off. It's, it's impossible. It's impossible. You're absolutely right. Even, even if you're just do if you're not sparring or actually doing it against someone, even if you're just doing, you know, like the forms, which are like the katas, you know, the rehearsed movements and, and just that takes all your attention, you know, to really do the technique properly and, and get through the, the workout. And it's more like, you know, when I was a teenager, I did a lot, I did sports, you know, like soccer was a big sport for me and, and lacrosse and, street sports when I was younger, you know, like football and baseball in the street. But even that takes all your attention. You know, if you're really engaged in playing a game, man, you know, that's it. Your mind's there. And I, I like that. You know, it's fun. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It, I think people are attracted to it and then they're also scared of it. You know, anyone, even if you play in a couple of these like celebrity softball games or whatever, I I remember playing in one at, uh, in Chicago, you know, there was like 30,000 people in the stadium and I'm playing left field and it's at night and someone just hits some booming fly ball and you're like drifting into the night and, you know, Jim McMahon crushes one and it's going to the night air and there's a whole bank of people in the, in the, along the, uh, third base line and they're all yelling don't drop it don't drop and it's like every ounce of your attention is on that ball for that second and it's exhilarating, but it's potentially devastating. Yeah, and they're not going to be, if you drop it, they're not going to be forgiving because you're not a baseball player. <laughs> oh, they're you tried. Gonna, oh, you tried. Not gonna, no, 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 no. There's no credit for that. <laughs> they're all yelling, don't drop it. As you're like drifting into foul territory and screaming, hey, man, show where the juggies. So give us uh, some, uh, as someone who has, transitioned from you know pack a day smoker not working out not looking out for yourself to a guy who's uh embraced the uh ancient wisdom of the orient what uh what do you do give us a, a little thumbnail sketch of kind of your schedule things you eat things you work on things you try to be conscious of well regular exercise just i mean when I started, I was in 2002, I guess I was 36. Now I'm 54. So that there's a big difference physically who you are in your thirties and in your fifties. So I'm, I'm glad I started taking care of myself then. Cause I think that as you get older, the toll of not doing that just is bigger and bigger. So, you know, there's just the health thing and isn't shooting a TV show or a movie. They're long days, 12, 14 hour days. And you need that that stamina, you know, you need to be physically fit. It's, it's, 
usually the stuff I do often has an element of chasing or ru- chasing the chasing the bad guys or running away from the cops, one or the <laughs> other. I'm I'm usually doing one or the other. So, you know, um, and and also you have to be physically fit enough to be present after 12 hours if you're doing a big heavy scene and there's a close up and you know it's the money shot and you have to deliver so there's a lot of benefit in being healthier um i i've been meditating for i guess the last 12 years um and that's a good way i think to start to get a sense of how your mind works and how you respond to stressors and you know things in life that can push you over the edge and 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 maybe give you a bit of a delay when dealing with them you know can we uh i'll jump to a subject uh the spider goodfellas you those scenes in the in the bar yeah club um it's 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 one of the most memorable like kind of iconic scenes really for me and in, in, in movie making history um did you know what you had when you were doing it i mean you probably couldn't have known all of what you had when you were shooting it but did you have an inkling and then how did you even get there well i knew what it was for me you know from i i was 23 i had been trying to get work for years as an actor i had done a couple of little things in movies i'd been studying for a long time but um for me it was like going from the minors to yankee stadium in the world mm-hmm. series you know to be with de niro and scorsese because they were heroes of mine as a new york kid who wanted to be an actor um so after those two days you know, it was a success for me because they were all happy and they felt that Marty felt like he got what he wanted, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. whether or not it was going to stay in the movie, whether or not it was going to be a good movie, whether or not the scenes were going to be interesting. I had no idea, you know. Um, But for me, it was like, you know, uh, arriving to the big leagues, basically. Do you have any specific uh, memories, encounters, uh, discussions with whomever, Pesci, De Niro, or Scorsese, well, anything I, from those things? This was this. I had done three movies before then, right? One was a, the first one was a big Hollywood movie called Lean on Me with Morgan Freeman. Yeah. Directed by John Alvidson, who did Rocky. And I had one line. Yeah. The line was, hey, I'm going to be a star, which got cut because it, I was so bad. <laughs> Because I was terrified. I'd never been in front of a camera before. I'd been on stage and I had been a classroom actor and stuff, but I'd never been in front of a movie camera. And he didn't have a lot of patience. There was like 500 kids in the auditorium, high school kids who get, you know, it was about a high school. And, you know, there were a lot of kids in the scene with me and he had no patience for me. And uh, I did that once and I mumbled because I was nervous. And he's like, hey, if you don't give me something on that line, you're out of here. And I was, which is terrible to hear on your first movie you know he's known as the king of the underdogs <laughs> yeah there i am oh see i'm in the denim vest or look right at by it. morgan yeah, freeman's yeah. right hand right. Oh, this is when he kicked that whole the whole he group in the group I, he, he kicked you out of school yeah yeah oh, i was kid. the bad i was the bad white kid basically <laughs> the one um but so when i got then i did two little things in two indie movies that nobody saw and then i got cast in goodfellas and when i got to the set I met Marty at the audition and he was really nice. And then when I got on the set, he couldn't have been nicer. Like he treated me like I was one of the stars of the movie, like comes right up to me. If you need me, I'm in the trailer. And we started talking about, you know, and the wardrobe person put me in like a waiter suit and he said to the wardrobe, no, this is not a legitimate establishment. He's not wearing a tie and a shirt. It's a social club. And he just included me in everything. And he said, one thing I'll ask of you is to treat the actors on and off camera like the characters, which for me made it very liberating because I didn't have to be this intimidated young actor with, you know, my heroes and stuff. I could just be this guy who's there to serve them, you know, and take care of the table. So what I did was, and I don't know why I did this. I just had this instinct. In hindsight, I probably never would have done it after I became much more, you know, more, after I became more professional. I went to the prop guy and I said, I want to reset the uh, 
the props, the table, the drinks and all that stuff. I want to reset it between takes. Like I want to handle the table. And Marty said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let him do that. And then I, tr they actually had the bottles where my character is making the drinks turned away from the table. And I said, no, you have to put the bottles in front. So if I'm making a drink, I can watch them all the time. So I can be attentive to their needs. And they did that, which in the moment seemed normal. But when I look back, that's a really uh, ballsy thing, mm. you know, but in the moment, I didn't think it was. I just was like, he, cause he made me feel like I belong there and it was time to play and have fun. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm forever grateful for that. You but know, do you think that you would have thought to do that if he didn't say you are this person, there are those people and stay in that role or stay in that mindset? Because if you're in that mindset, you would be thinking if I did work here, I would put the, right. the bottles here and I would do that. Do you think that subconsciously sort of gave you the courage to do that? It was that and it was his kindness, you know, <clears throat> by making me feel welcome by being patient and, and making me feel comfortable. Because when, when an actor feels tension, especially yeah. a young actor, because you're so vulnerable, you want to be a success and, and you know, you want to be good and you want the director to like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. you know, when there's tension, you close and you're not going to be yeah. creative and you're not going to follow impulses. It's, it's such a weird thing. I, I, I've always kind of felt that, you know, you work with people that are high strung and they're tense and they're this mm -hmm. and they're that and they're kind of, and they're like, don't fuck this up. Now act or go or read the prompt or whatever it is. And you're like, you're not going to get one tenth out of me as good as you could have got if you said, hey, man, have fun. If you fuck it up, we'll just go again. You know, like it's so right. much better to approach it that way. But there's still people that run it like the fucking great Santini's playing a basketball game. You know, <laughs> fucking elbow you and tell you to get out of the way and you're no good. And it's like, I never get I just don't get it. I remember a million years ago, uh, me and Jimmy and his cousin Sal were doing some big MTV live football halftime tailgate extravaganza. I think they let us go out there in like 2003 or something. And we went out to San Diego and we're doing this big sort of just MTV guys from the man show extravaganza. And, and like cousin Sal, had to do something and cousin Sal never not really been on TV at that point. And Danny two sheets, these guys should all be Sopranos. Uh, Danny two sheets, Daniel Kelsen was sort of drinking a beer and hanging out. He was saying to Sal, don't be nervous. It's only live in front of, you know, 30 million people. Don't be nervous. It was like having a fun time with him because Sal busted balls, you know, but I pulled Daniel aside. I was like, leave the guy alone. He's not used to being on TV. He might be, freaked out by this like right. don't do it like ralph cramden when he did the commercial <laughs> norton right. says you just go on the guy says you're on the air and then millions of people will be looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to worry about <laughs> all right uh you're gonna hang out and do some uh news with us michael i'll do it yeah uh let me hit uh omaha steaks and then we'll do that stuck in oh yes you are time to stock up Get some Omaha steaks. They deliver the world's best steaks and a huge variety of uh, family favorites without leaving your home. We'll go right, come right to your door, nice and clean and fast. Right now, they got a limited time stock up sale just for our listeners. You can go to omahasteaks.com, enter Adam into the research, uh, sorry, into the search bar and unlock a unique savings just for my listeners. I've been enjoying a lot of their all offerings uh i have my uh, nanny olga making me up uh had the steak with the chimichurri the other night had the uh mushroom burgers all all the recipes are online at uh, omahasteaks.com and you're gonna get um you're gonna get 50 percent uh worth of savings you save 50 percent on your order when you uh put my name into the search bar and free shipping on orders of over 69 bucks right dawson Never been a better time to stock up on Omaha Steaks. Stock up sale is going on right now with ready-to-ship packages. Save 50% or more, plus free shipping on orders of $69 or more. That's omahasteaks.com. Type Adam in the search bar. All right. Let's take a quick break. Oh, I'm just looking at a picture of Cousin Sal from the, uh, yeah, I guess it was Raiders and uh, Tampa Bay was uh, 
What was that one? Yeah. Oh, we're looking at a picture. It's me, Jimmy, and Carson. It was Daly the year and... the, the Kimmel debuted, right? Because that yeah, was the year we, Tampa Bay won. Yeah, we went down there. Uh, Tampa Bay beat the crap out of Oakland. Oakland had, a, I think, an offensive lineman go AWOL. Like Barrett like, Robbins. <laughs> he had like mental issues, and he literally yeah. just cr- went yeah. to Tijuana or something. The day before the Super Bowl or something, he just kind of went AWOL, and that, that, was, that was the first domino to fall. Yeah, and then we uh, came back and uh, launched Jimmy's show, and I think Warren Sapp flew on a helicopter from San Diego to Hollywood to be the lead guest on uh jimmy's show all right so uh that's uh that was that we'll walk down memory lane all right we'll take a quick break uh michael hang with us and we'll do uh news with gina grad right after this news with grad news with gina grad breaking viral all those crazy trump tweets give me news with gina grad trouble in the middle east celebrity drug meltdown see news with gina gina grad the news with Gina Grad. Of course, there is a lot of news today, especially pandemic news, but I, I cannot miss this opportunity to speak with Mr. Imperioli uh, this close and not ask you a question if that's all right. I, I'm one of those uh, crazy fan nerds that's seen the series 17 times and we just wow. finished all it right. again recently. And uh, I, the podcast is great. I finished the second episode, I have the books. I'm, I'm, I'm a crazy person. Um, my fiance, who's seen the show as much as I have, believes to his core that this the show is not about the mafia. It's about children learning how to deal with the effect that parents with behavioral and personality disorders have on their children. And I know that everybody gets a different theme. I know you said on your podcast that one of the recurring themes is feeling underappreciated. Every character at some point talks about how they're underappreciated. So would you, A, care to validate him or break his heart? And B, what other themes do you think we might have missed in our 17 viewings? I think he's really onto something. You know, the the last... The last uh, show, the podcast we recorded... Um, hasn't been released yet, but uh, it's a, there's a scene when Livy is talking to Junior and basically is saying that her son needs to be killed. Without you know, saying it. Without saying it. And, and, and I said, see, so she really wants her son dead. I said, that's so psychotic and fucked up, you know, mentally, you know, that it, it's, it's, bigger than anything else on the show in a weird way thematically you know so and david did say that what he wants when you know the the kernel you know the seed of the show was about his relationship with his mother right his mother was a very interesting character not as extreme as livia but there were elements of that mm-hmm. he just you know expanded on that so i do think your husband is really onto something oh all his Christmases just I'm came. I'm sorry, I said the F so word because I'm usually I used, used to say it on my podcast. I don't know if you allow oh, it. So. Please, That's, by all means. That's okay. All right, I'm all not right. a big cursor, but I just did it. <laughs> I, I, maybe the psychodynamic part of that series of The Sopranos. Maybe that is what secretly attracted so many people who yeah. didn't appear. Like because if you said to most people. People look at mafia gangster movies kind of like they look at Westerns. They go, eh, not my genre. Mm-hmm. Don't like Westerns. Uh, uh, the, but the Western guys don't like sci-fi. So like right. since, since when do, why would a majority maybe even of women love the Sopranos? You know, why, why is this so enticing to such a large uh, and, and such a ver- varied group of Americans? It, mm-hmm. it, everyone I knew loved it and they didn't feel that way about westerns or sci-fi no. that that broke them off you know and and to your point every almost every male character is equal parts lovable and despicable chrissy being at the very top of that list right yeah so and, yeah and the women are very strong characters yes in the show. i mean even and because and, we're i haven't watched these episodes since they initially aired so I've, i'm on like episode 11 right now i've watched 11 so i'm going week by week even you see Jamie Lynn Sigler's character, Meadow, she's like a mob wife in training in a way. Yes. She's hardcore and tough. Like she doesn't give Christopher up when, you know, 
she she buys drugs from him yeah. and and she could have and she's very honest with her father and bluntly asks him is he in the mafia and there's there's she's a not strength to, yeah he's not afraid of like anything it seems you yeah. know and um you know Edie as well you know she when they have to stash they know the feds are you know gonna search the house and they stash the guns and money and st- stuff Edie's paves the way for that by going to the nursing home and getting rid of Livia. Right. And she does such an incredible job of being both complicit and completely out of the loop by design at the same time. It's it, it, the whole show is a masterpiece. No. Yeah, uh, I agree. So, I, yeah, I, I agree. Hate... Everyone agrees. Yeah, I, I, I also, am, I, I guess I'm pretty pure about it because I got on late which is I got on, I don't know, season three or something and and fell in love with it, which is different. A, a lot of people had been watching it, obviously been talking about it and telling me to watch it. I just never, I just don't watch a series that often. But so I got onto it late and it would have been easy to go, ah, come on, what's everyone talking about? I told you, I told you. Like you, there's a part where you kind of want to be right when you don't go out and see something early early on but i was immediately hooked Mm. sorry go ahead gina all right let's do some news if we must so the center for disease control and prevention now says we're supposed to practice social distancing from our family pets it's official we talked about the pug yesterday we've talked about the zoo animals and the cats we we everybody already thinks their pet is their you know their human family member and scientists want us to extend that treatment with respect to this virus again we talked about the cats the dogs the tigers they are contracting covid19 fucking wrestled my fucking dog every fucking night (laughs) oh you guys will be fine every goddamn night tuesday the cdc released these new guidelines and i quote do not let pets interact with people or animals outside the household good luck to you adam if a person inside the household becomes sick isolate them from everyone including pets well again it's it's a good first world problem to have you Mm. know while uh, other countries are thinking about eating their pets, we're talking about getting the old, maybe the ultimate social distancing in a bizarre way, actually eliminating the pet and yeah. consuming it. Ingesting. <laughs> Ingesting the pet. Uh, well, I know- actually, yeah, I got a little bit afraid because the big happy story, the big silver lining to this pandemic, this quarantine has been all the shelters are empty. Everybody's home. They want to adopt a new uh, new family member, a new pet. And now the shelters are cleaned out. And isn't that wonderful? Are these uh, animals going to find themselves back at the pound now that the CDC is saying that? I don't know. But if I can't go out with one of my friends and have a goddamn steak and a martini, I am going to eat someone's pet. (laughs) I'm starting to get to that point now. I the 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 greatest love of my adult life was going out for a steak and a martini with a friend. And that's I don't know what we're on week seven or six Mm -hmm. or whatever. Me not not doing that. But it's that's starting to drive me nuts. And I want to start opening steakhouses. I don't care. I don't care about nail salons. I don't care about no. tattoo parlors. Fuck essential those people, businesses. Essential right. steak houses. Let's and get with that. those banquettes, you probably yeah. do have the six feet. We fucking, well, I, I was literally thinking about it, like Kevin Hench and I had a, a booth that they would always uh, give us at, um, oh God, when I, <laughs> at Morton's. Morton's. Always, I'd just call them up, go Sunday night, six o'clock, the usual booth. I go, yeah. And we'd go sit in a far corner with this big high booth, just two mm-hmm. dudes. There wasn't anyone near us. Like it would work. Sorry, Brian. Go. I was going to say, Jenny, I know you're not an enthusiastic meat eater, but the steakhouses, the high, most like traditional steakhouses don't have the banquettes. That's the great thing about them. They're all booths. They're all red booths and uh, right. throwback leather. And so the that's King's actually probably a good place. What good place to open up. Yeah. Uh, Michael Imperioli, everybody. <laughs> Talking Sopranos. It's available now on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. Real Michael Imperioli is his is, uh, Instagram, if you want to shout out to him. Thanks, uh, Michael. We appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was fun. Always We'll is. Uh, take a uh, quickie break, and we'll come back with a one-on-one with Congressman and former Navy SEAL Dan Crenshaw right after this. <laughs> 